as president for studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. It's a real pleasure to welcome two friends of Carnegie Endowment to a discussion today about what we've been calling in our series COVID and the Kremlin. And we're going to look at some of the political fallout from the crisis on the Russian political system. Um, a couple of ground rules before we get started. First of all, we're de truly delighted to have Yekaterina Shulman with us, who is in, uh, in a way only in Russia, uh, a, a political science professor who has made an incredible mark on the Russian political discussion by hosting regular chats from her kitchen table and then broadcasting those live on YouTube where she has more than a quarter million followers. Unfortunately, Katya is not sitting at her kitchen table today. She's sitting in Moscow though and joins us from there. Joining us as well from outside Moscow, uh, from uh, his secret uh, undisclosed dacha location is Alexander Baunov, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Moscow Center. Um, Alexander Baunov is one of Russia's most prominent political analysts, um, a very prolific observer of Russian political developments and had a very fascinating piece last week in the US and foreign affairs, um, which we'll use as the jumping off point. A couple of ground rules before we get started. There's a distinguished group of, of uh, Russia watchers sitting here with us virtually in Zoom. At the moment, your microphones are turned off, but after I pose a few opening questions to Alexander and Yekaterina, we will open the floor up. So if people who are in the Zoom conversation want to raise your uh, hand virtually, go to the participants tab in Zoom and hit the raise hand button and I'll call on you in order. Or you can hit me a chat message directly in Zoom and I can pass your question to Katerina and Sasha. There will also be opportunity for people who are watching this via YouTube live to post questions via YouTube and we're monitoring that. So if folks can uh, contribute in either uh, virtual way, we're, we're delighted. Um, so let me just, before we get uh, too deep into the conversation about uh, what's happening in Russia, um, in classic American form, let's talk about me first. And <laughs> I'd be very <laughs> curious, Alexander, if you could talk a little bit about the Russian reaction to the horrible events that have unfolded in the United States. We've seen uh, a lot of things happen very quickly involving uh, human suffering, involving the question of systemic racism, police brutality, and then unfortunately, what looks like to a lot of us, abuse of power by uh, the senior most leaders of the United States, uh, abuse of power and a vacuum of power at the same time. So the US moral standing to sit around and for us to criticize a lot of countries around the world um, is going to be more difficult. And you know, we need to hold a mirror up to ourselves. We're not always very good at doing that in the United States, but I'm sort of curious how it looks to you from Moscow and, and the way you would characterize both official and unofficial Russian views of what's happening in the United States. Well, despite the growing alliance between Russia and China, I would say, to my opinion, the Russian view on what happens in the United States is slightly more complicated than the Chinese one, as far as I understand the Chinese one, but I don't read in Chinese, unfortunately. We have other colleagues. Uh, uh, but in China, it's, it looks like that for them, the things are a simple case uh, a crying case of uh, crying case of American hypocrisy. Uh, there were protests in Hong Kong, uh, the brutal crackdown of this protest in Hong Kong, and now the Americans who criticized uh, hard critic were hardly hard, hard criticizing the Chinese authorities about this are doing the same and even worse things in all over the American cities. Uh, China had. Uh, well, Russia had not recently, well, mass protests uh, to, to compare uh, the behavior of Russian and American policemen. Uh, Russian protests generally, well, in general is, uh, and we follow it for 20 years of 
the crackdowns of uh, Russian protests. And the Russian protest is more peaceful. Uh, it's not accompanied by uh, breaking windows of shops. And generally, Russian protest is very friendly towards the uh, young Russian capitalism. It, uh, mm, it pay attention to the private property. Cars are not burned. Uh, so the pictures of what happens on Moscow streets are different from, well, the pictures we have, even in the case of protests are different uh, compared to what we see in the United States. So how uh, then Russia, what is Russia? Russia is split into official point of view and uh, the approach of critical-minded, uh, liberal, progressive Russians. And of course, there is a, dif a generation, difference between generations. Uh, it could be imagined that for the official point, for the officials, the weaker the United States are, the, the more chaotic uh, uh, the pictures for the United States are, uh, is better. It gives a kind of, positive background to what happens in Russia. Look how bad things are over the ocean, on the other side of the ocean, look how peaceful and quiet things are here, even in case of protests. Uh, but uh, from the other side, of course, Russian authorities uh, project the situation on themselves and are not interested uh, uh, in supporting the protesters against the American authorities uh, because they use the force themselves. So they, they are interested uh, in justifying the use of force because they can imagine that uh, uh, they will do, or in, in some situation they will do the same, or uh, they can imagine doing the same. For the progressive Russians, uh, so it's it, it could be imagined that for Kremlin, uh, the, uh, flowing the protests, uh, radicalizing the American protests, and supporting the radical American protesters is uh, is their main goal. But uh, it is one of their goals, maybe. But the other goal is to justify the use of force and to justify the crackdown. So the the sympathy is split between the protesters and the state and the police. Uh, the progressive Russians are not understanding that, uh, or are not feeling that deeply this racial issue is the American progressives. So even liberal Russians are not sympathizing so much the protesters as maybe the American or Western European counterpart. It's partly because uh, the racial issue is connected in the minds of the older Soviet liberals uh, or Russian liberals who were Soviet liberals or post-Soviet liberals with Soviet propaganda. The racial issue was one of the main point, uh, uh, racial contro contro controversies in the United States was one of the main point in the Soviet propaganda. So for them, this uh, racial agenda is too left and Russian liberals, at least of uh, older and mid generation uh, are much less left and in this sense of word liberal than the uh, Western ones. And uh, the, the biggest similarity between the approaches of, well, the American progressive, the American liberals and the Russian liberals, uh, uh, we see when we look at the younger generation for uh, them, the left agenda or left liberal agenda is not stigmatized by the Soviet past. Okay, well, that's fascinating. And it definitely creates a lot of cognitive dissonance um, back here. So I, you know, I really applaud your ability to, to summarize so, so uh, elegantly. So enough about me, let's talk about you. Um, there has been a lot of uh, coverage during the height of the pandemic that authoritarians love COVID. And this has become a, a really consistent theme of a lot of Western mainstream conventional wisdom that authoritarian rulers like Putin jump on opportunities like the coronavirus and it 
you know, it's, they use it to strengthen their power and people come up with examples of how Putin is doing this. There's a separate narrative in conventional wisdom, Yekaterina, which talks about how this is potentially the last straw and that, you know, the pain from the collapse in oil prices, the surge in infections in Russia, there's now more than, I think, 430,000 reported cases of coronavirus in Russia. All of this, you know, can show how uh, Russia may be destabilized by the pandemic. And I'm, and to put my own, you know, uh, reason for bringing the two of you together today, what I found fascinating in both of your work is I feel like we haven't paid enough attention in the West to the regime's resilience and the forces that sort of keep it in place and how even this crisis, and Sasha wrote about this last week, has wrong-footed, has put both the regime on an unstable footing and its opponents on an unstable footing because what people were expecting to happen didn't happen necessarily, except for the horrible human trauma that the disease is causing. So I'm just sort of curious, Katerina, if we could sort of pull on some of these themes, do you see the conventional wisdom in the West is being wrong? Like, what are we missing about the reality of how the Putin regime operates and what it relies on? Uh, I can understand uh, both these uh, theories. They are not totally groundless. They are both based on some segment of the reality. Uh, the idea that uh, autocratic uh, regimes glory in emergency situations, which allows them to apply that repressive mechanism that has been lying dormant for so long is, of course, understandable. Uh, and the idea that uh, when faced with a real threat, the aging uh, autocratic uh, political machine will may possibly crumble is also understandable and if not completely realistic at least it's not baseless it's not completely groundless uh, i have read with great pleasure uh alexander's article in foreign policy it's uh, uh it was foreign affairs i'm sorry uh, it's foreign foreign affairs yeah. uh, excuse yeah. me uh, it's in clear and elegant uh, english prose which is always a pleasure uh, to read and it presents this kind of nuanced uh picture which always appeals to me uh in anything uh that deals with russian affairs because Russia is nothing if not complicated. Every country is complicated, but we flatter ourselves with the idea that we are particularly uh, complex. Uh, so taking both these, uh, taking both these uh, theories, both these points of view, uh, let us try to understand what is, what is true in them and what is exaggerated. Uh, really any uh, emergency situation that the government, any government, democratic or autocratic reacts to, generally produces the so-called rallying round the flag effect. It has been considered as an almost instinctive reaction on the part of the society to any threat, especially external threat, that again, the powers that be react to in some way that is not totally chaotic. And we have indeed seen this rallying around the flag effect, higher support and higher approval ratings for, again, any sort of government in almost every country hit by the pandemic. We have seen it in France, we have seen it in Italy, we have seen it in Central Europe, in uh, United Kingdom. We have seen it in the United States for a short time. It has been short-lived, but still it has been there. Surprisingly, Russia has been almost the only country where this rallying around the flag effect has been missing. So we have not seen any rise in the president's either personal popularity or approval rating. The tendencies that we've been watching for the last two years remained in place. They were rather accelerated by the pandemic than influenced by it in any other direction. I still don't have the answer to this. I don't have the answer to the question why Russia is such an exception to this general rule. Because uh, we cannot say that a Russian government, Russian power failed in some very spectacular way in dealing with the epidemiological threat. I quite agree with Alexander. There have been no administrative breakdown. There have been no chaos. 
Uh, the figures of infection have been high, by, but mortality figures were tolerable, if we may use such an adjective, uh, towards mortality. Uh, so there has been no, so far, no split in the elites, no defection, uh, no mass riots, no anything. So we may say that the huge uh, Russian bureaucracy has been more or less coping with what's been happening. But these efforts were significantly uh, underestimated or at least were not met with any great approval on the part of the people. Again, I cannot say that I have a clear answer to why is it happening. I have a few theories of my own, one of them being that uh, the tendencies of public opinion or public consciousness that we've been again watching uh, since uh, 2018 were too objectively driven to be influenced by any external event, even such a vast external event as uh, the pandemic. Uh, another interesting detail in this um, polling data was the slight raise of popularity for regional leaders. I would call your attention to this fact because it rhymes with some other things happening to uh, the Russian political machine. And that was what has been since called the creeping federalization. It has also been described in Alexander's article as the attempt and quite a successful attempt uh, on the part of the president to delegate responsibility in dealing with the epidemic to the uh, heads of the regions. But uh, this rise in popularity preceded the pandemic, as again, every sociological tendency of importance has preceded the pandemic. It has virtually brought us nothing new. It just accelerated those things that were happening before. And this is interesting, indeed. Maybe it's not surprising, but still it's interesting. So to return to uh, the original leaders, uh, we do not have the data per region. And of course, every governor is different. For example, I would dearly love to see the figures for the mayor of Moscow, but they are not in the public domain. So I can't say uh, what they may be. Although we have uh, figures of, of trust for him in uh, Levada. Uh, if, if you visit their site, you, you will see those figures. Uh, the so-called open question of trust, when the respondents are asked to name those figures that they would trust with the affairs of the government, uh, Sabanin has quite low figures between two and 4% from 2017 to uh, the end of May. But still, uh, again, the trajectory is rather upward than downward. But uh, when I'm talking about the uh, approval figures for regional governors in general, I'm talking about the answers to the question, do you approve of the job done by your original leader as asked to any respondent taking part in the poll? And of course, there is no such political entity as regional governors. Every respondent is thinking of his or her specific governor, and so figures may be different. But we see that people rather tend to think that the head of their own subject of the federation is kind of trying to do his job. So the blame for any shortcoming is rather put on the federal authorities than on the regional. And this is quite new. I would say it's surprisingly new because for decades, it's been the other way around. The president was the focus of hopes and aspirations. The idea was that if you manage to get your issue known to the president, then it will be solved. But uh, authorities close to the ground were thought to be ineffective, corrupt, lazy, etc. And the president indulged from time to time in those theatrical uh, scenes of um, uh, chastising uh, the, uh, this or that uh, unfortunate person uh, who happened to be to blame for uh, something. And that was always effective. That was the kind of political theater that people liked. So something snapped there. Uh, for immediate political consequences of this rather vague trade trend that I've been trying to describe. Look at the relations between the uh, Moscow government and the federal government, and generally the Moscow elite group and the what has been called 20 years ago, federal. Uh, I'm kind of guessing we'll see a lot of interesting things happening there in the nearest future. So that's fascinating. Um, Sasha, can you talk a little bit about 
there are certain ways we personify everything. We always tend to focus on individuals. And so particularly mm -hmm. there is a fascination with anything that Mr. Putin is doing. Um, and what we've seen in this case, and you wrote about this, is he, and Katarina talked about, it, he basically backed away and basically acted as if COVID was too small an issue for him. But what we also saw as the camera moved back was the capacity of Russian state institutions was exposed as very weak as well. Both the healthcare system, which has been underfunded for a long time, and the repressive apparatus, the, the security apparatus did not take the lead on managing this crisis like it did in China. So I'm just sort of curious what, you know, when there's, a, there's an old line on, uh, in America, which is when there's a big financial crisis and you're standing on the beach, the water goes back out and you see who was not wearing a bathing suit. And it feels a little bit like this is what has happened as far as Russian state institutions are concerned. Can you talk a little bit about who was not wearing a bathing suit and who also though remains able to sort of keep the system together? Because what Yekaterina was describing is a system that is not experiencing that much stress, as I understand it. Uh, there is a one and the main Russian institution that is called Vladimir Putin. Here, the Western vision is not very uh, remote from the reality. And when this institution is stepping into the background, of course, well, we see a larger picture, other figures appeared. And when well, by stepping, by receding into the background, of course, Vladimir Putin gives space uh, to more uh, internal uh, fight fight inside uh, between the groups in, in, inside the elite. Uh, Putin, my understanding is that he planned to do uh, what Yekaterina has described. Uh, there, is an, uh, there is an event that repeats uh, every year, the direct line between uh, Vladimir Putin and his uh, good people, when uh, people directly over the heads of local elites approaches or asks Putin to do something, some wonders, and he uh, blaming the locals are making different wonders from big ones like uh, constructing a road or repairing a road, the very small ones like uh, giving a pine tree for the Christmas to, uh, or for the new year in Russian case to a poor family these sort of things. And uh, uh, the strategy he has chosen was similar. The governors, the local uh, governors had been chosen to play bad guys who introduce restrictions and lockdown measures who stops the local economies. And that's uh, making people, uh, uh, depriving people from their incomes. And he from the center uh, is a main uh, state bank here uh, is redistributing financial help. But again, as Ekaterina uh, stressed, the trick didn't, hasn't worked at, as, as it was planned. Surprisingly, uh, allowing uh, the local governors to fight against, so ter territorializing, decentralizing the, the fight against the pandemic, uh, by stepping to the background, uh, he made them more popular than himself. And he weakened his uh, role of the central institution and did it exactly before uh, the voting, the referendum about the prolongation of his, uh, the possibility of the prolongation of his uh, power, uh, he postponed from the April to, as we know now, the first two line. Uh, and when the main institution that is a, that uh, keeps together the elite is weakened, the members of the elite not just stepping to the front, but starting to fight against each other uh, about the role of the main fighter and 
victorious, future victorious uh, fighter or, uh, against the pandemic. And we saw clearly uh, the battle around Moscow. Moscow is a very attractive asset. There's a huge Moscow budget. There are maybe two or three things with uh, um, uh, such attractiveness. Russian oil, Sberbank, who is the main state uh, owned bank of the country and one of the major world banks and the Moscow budget. And Moscow uh, that became the epicenter of the pandemic with the most populous town city, not just of Russia, but of uh, Europe. If we acknowledge Russia is Europe, it's uh, the it metropolis. Is. With the, <laughs> it is. That's a <laughs> big, like, some, somebody, somebody, somebody argues, argue, uh, argue against. Uh, it's 515 million inhabitants. Mm, uh, became the epicenter of the pandemic with the well, most active uh, connections with the outside world. And uh, the propaganda was true by uh, saying that uh, virus started spreading in Russia from abroad and from the West, not by the way, not from China. Uh, Moscow became an attractive uh, uh, a pride for those who wanted to keep their hands to to to, uh, to put their hands on the Moscow budget, and of course the Moscow mayor Sabayan, who for at least for in the beginning of the pandemic became a, the, the the front man of this battle. Uh, uh, even his first speech and first his first um, speech with first very first restriction measures, lockdown measures, and assistant measures uh, came three days earlier than the, the first appearance uh, uh, of Putin about the same, uh, dedicated to the same subject. Uh, uh, many inside the ruling elite were interested in showing that uh, um, Moscow is overdoing in lockdown and is not up to the uh, level of its wealth uh, in the healthcare system. And we don't, uh, my impression is that they don't, didn't succeed. At least uh, there were many who uh, were lobbying for introducing the emergency, uh, declaring the emergency situation in Moscow. Uh, by that, this, by Moscow government and Sabanian personally would have lost the power and it could go to the hands of one of the representative, uh, representatives of the security forces to the Silopiki, to the, not to the army, I suppose, to the police or um, maybe security services, but it didn't happen. So Yekaterina, there's a big political calendar coming up now in Russia. And as much as our attention in the West has been focused on uh, the reaction of the authorities to the pandemic, it seems that there is a split screen where the authorities have been as focused on the staging of the victory parade and the vote to confirm Putin as Sultan and to basically extend his presidential term potentially till 2036 and the mechanics of orchestrating these two big shows, the, the victory parade is on June 24th and the plebiscite or referendum, whatever you wanna call it, is on July 1, seem to have swallowed a lot of the political uh, oxygen. And that seems to have been as big a focus as saving the public from the virus. Can you talk a little bit about whether that process, which looks to, you know, outside eyes as very theatrical. It's not like, you know, Russia needs another parade. It's not like Russia needs another vote, right, where we know the outcome in advance. Can you talk about why that theater is so important to the legitimacy of the regime and why it invests so much effort in stage managing these upcoming events? I would agree with you that uh, this uh, constitutional voting, which by the way is not a referendum, so please don't call it uh, that, uh, it has been the priority 
are the number one focus for the whole decision making class for for the whole bureaucracy uh, from the highest to the lowest and i do think that a certain delay with introducing anti-pandemic measures were uh, connected to some kind of hope that maybe the virus will bypass russia by some miracle and then uh, both the parade and the voting uh, would be able to proceed at the scheduled rate uh, indeed, the uh, political need for such a constitutional reform uh, is quite simple to explain. That's what uh, autocracies of this type do. When they reach a certain stage in their development, they need in order to uh, prolong their existence, in order to achieve what, we, what they perceive as stability, uh, they need the incumbent to remain in place and they need their elites to be assured that their way of life now will be prolonged for some indefinite or definite even better uh, futures. So that's what happened. Some tampering uh, with their terms in power uh, happened to almost every semi-autocracy on the face of the earth in Latin America, in Central Asia, uh, in um, uh, Asia, uh, Southwestern, uh, yes. Uh, so in, in, in almost every country of this type, that is not surprising. There is only one thing surprising here and that was the timing and another related mystery, the speed. We were, we all of us, uh, the, the commentary at the, the Russia watchers were expecting constitutional reform. I remember very well, uh, I was on air on uh, Echo Moscow the day before the presidential address to the Federal Assembly, uh, which happened on January 15th. And I said, uh, we know from the uh, public reaction to the previous uh, addresses that this address will be less about the army, there will be less foreign policy because it's now evident that people don't buy this uh, any longer. So we'll hear about uh, fighting poverty, we'll hear about demography, and about constitutional reform we'll possibly hear next year closer to the parliamentary and the presidential elections. That's what I said. And next day was January 15th. So I was right in everything except the timing. And still, again, let me repeat this phrase that experts so rarely have the chance of using, I don't have the answer. Uh, you know, you know the answers possibly to this question. They're popular. Now they are disseminated on social media and even in some mainstream media. Uh, the simple answer to the question why this hurry, but we have no uh, reliable information, so we just can't say. But it proceeded at breakneck sp speed. Uh, the, the first mention was January 15. On January 20th, uh, the uh, amendments were introduced. The first reading version was introduced into the Duma. Uh, by uh, March, the constitutional procedure, as far as parliament was concerned, was uh, over. And on uh, April 22, uh, we had to have uh, this all national uh, voting. But then external factors uh, interfered. So the whole political scheme broke down because the voting was to be connected to uh, the anniversary of uh, uh, the victory, this, the 75th uh, anniversary. It was to be the grand event with foreign leaders invited with the parade uh, and the good weather and all this national festivity which uh, usually accompanies uh, the 9th of May. And that was to happen a week after the victorious end uh, of the outcome of the constitutional voting. So that was the plan and then it couldn't materialize. So what, what happens now? Uh, what has been happening these recent days? Was uh, federal political management trying to find this really very, very narrow window of opportunity when it was possible to hold this voting? sometime after the at least the some seeming victory over the pandemic but before the economic effects of the crisis and let me remind you that crisis was not brought to russia by the virus it was there before but the voting had to be held before the full effects of the crisis were felt by the populace. So it was politically impossible to hold this voting in autumn. Even in July 1st, the results are not so predictable as you would say. Uh, I'm not, again, on my part, predicting any negative outcome, but uh, 
things may not go so smoothly as for example now during the presidential elections in 2018 which were the last quiet uh, electoral event uh, in uh, recent russian political history every next election became more and more problematic so the last one was uh in in uh, march 2018 and then uh, more or less uh quietly also went the re-election of the mayor of moscow in september of the same year the next year was uh 2018 and already in autumn of 2018 four uh governors lost their seats because they lost the regional elections a thing unheard of in russia since the 90s so maybe the first of july is the last possible date uh, june 24 would have been still better but this was not chosen because it, it's too soon uh the rules of the voting are being written as as we go new and new regulations appear from the central electoral commission uh every day that's happening in the u.s too by the way just so you know you know it <laughs> happens in other countries as well uh, emergencies are bad things for electoral process and of course uh political elites use this opportunity to rewrite the rules uh, so that uh, they can achieve the necessary results easier. It's a bad thing. There's no whitewashing it. Uh, I do hope that uh, the rules specifically scripted for this uh, constitutional voting will now diffuse into our real electoral legislation that regulates real elections. Uh, it's enough to have one uh, acclamation type plebiscite. We don't want, uh, for example, regional elections, mayoral elections, and parliamentary elections to turn into this type of farce. Okay, well, I'm conscious that we have a lot of very distinguished Russia hands in the Zoom room with us. And I just wanted to remind them, if you want to jump into this, go to the participants tab and hit raise hand. And I see one person waiting to be recognized. Can I call on you, Michael, right now? I'm gonna unmute your microphone and then it's up to you on whether you want to, um, uh, I'm trying to do this, or my colleague can unmute you. I'm not maybe as skilled at this. And then, okay, you're unmuted, Michael. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, and and if I, you want I, to turn I, on your camera, it's up to you. I I apologize. I uh, there we go. Okay, so apologies. Yeah. I'm not in the office, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for doing this call. Um, just a brief just, question. Just by introduction, this is Michael uh, Pevsner, yes. who's a, a, a staff member of the US United States Senate. Yes. And I'm uh, yeah. in a personal capacity. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for doing this call. Uh, and, and thanks uh, to Andrew and Carnegie. Uh, just a quick question, because uh, this issue again cropped up on Monday with uh, President Trump's call to President Putin which took place apparently uh, shortly before his call to the uh, United States national governors, um, where he uh, told them to dominate the protests and uh, put the Secretary of Defense on the line, who talked about the battle space and so on uh, uh, of the United States. And so obviously there's been some speculation, including in the press about you know what advice he may have sought from President Putin, but this brings a larger issue of how is the Trump-Putin relationship viewed, especially in the context of to what many here in the United States see as, you know, kind of his strange politics of alienating longtime allies, uh, insulting uh, uh, NATO partners and so on. Uh, now uh, his increasingly adversarial stance towards China, but it seems that with Mr. Putin, uh, he can do no wrong. And so I just wonder how that is viewed in uh, Russia. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll uh, sign off. So I was going to want to do Yeah, wanna... that's, that's your cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but I, I was not listening to their conversation. So I don't know how important and precious advice about the crackdown of uh, demonstrators <laughs> if, he could if give, I, if I can uh, just... Russian president could give to the American. Uh, colleague, his American colleague. Uh, it happened uh, immediately after the, uh, uh, the event that Russian diplomacy uh, assessed as very negative. It's uh, uh, after the United States left the Open Sky uh, Treaty, treaty, uh, treaty about the Open Sky. Uh, Russian leadership and Russian diplomacy uh, 
um, care a lot about uh, uh, keeping alive this uh, uh, legacy of treaties uh, of the Cold War era and post-Cold War years. So maybe it was related with this and not uh, with the protests. I not I'm not sure that uh, Putin could give to Trump to President Trump advices about how to deal with uh, such an violent uh, and a manifestation of the political uh, anger and social anger, of course, because Putin himself met uh, such an events maybe one or two times uh, in his long presidential career of almost 20 years. One was nationalist uh, uh, riot in, if I don't, I'm not mistaken, 2005, 2006 in uh, the center of Moscow. Another more recent event, um, it was in the Birilova, uh, the popular, uh, a bit xenophobic uh, uprising in one of the popular Close districts of Moscow. by the way. Uh, yeah. 10 years ago, time flies. 10 years ago, yes. Yeah. So we don't, uh, uh, he doesn't have uh, an experience of uh, uh, suppressing uh, the really popular, uh, uh, the really popular anger, the mass uh, anger uh, by the simple, normal people. He, he's very experienced in suppressing the uh, relatively narrow liberal opposition. So the socially uh, aliens, the socially uh, people who are not uh, the, the background of his regime. But if he meets the anger or disappointment or the protest of the, uh, of the simple people of the social uh, narrow uh, classes who support uh, his regime, uh, or supported at least in masses, it's much more difficult uh, situation for, for him. He, he is not experienced in suppressing the really uh, mass and popular uh, rioting. So, so Sasha and the relation between relation between uh, if 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 you, from the from the local perspective, uh, the relations between Putin and, and Trump are not that friendly. At least they are analyzed as much less friendly that maybe uh, they are seen from the American American liberal perspective. Uh, people here, I mean, the, the Kremlin in the ruling clique uh, expected much more uh, from Trump after after his election. So, they are so disappointed. I want to follow this thread, and then I have yeah. another question from from one of our colleagues that I'll pass on in a second. Mm. Uh, but Yekaterina, if you look at by comparison, how China has used various techniques, particularly digital techniques for societal control, and you compare that to how Russia used uh, a cell phone app that was supposed to give you a red or a green signal on whether you could go out during quarantine, whether you could mm -hmm. get permission to go outside to exercise, all of that sort of attempt to uh, copy and mimic Chinese style authoritarianism didn't work very well for this regime. And it seems, and I hear this anecdotally, you're closer, that the average person has not seen a lot of the authorities out there on the streets during this crisis and that there are fewer police uh, interactions that at the height of the pandemic um, then you certainly, you know, by any stretch compared to what you would have had in China. So I'm just sort of curious what that signal sends if we look forward, if we think about the second order, third order effects of this crisis. Sasha just said that this regime has focused on scaring liberal opposition figures and sort of controlling this very small Moscow political uh, opposition circles instead of thinking about how to control Russian society. And I'm sort of curious if you think that a key lesson from this crisis is that the model of societal control needs to change 
in the eyes of key figures around the most important people in the country? Or are they happy to just continue the model that they've used for the last 20 years, which has worked pretty well? This is a question uh, to me or to Ekaterina? Okay. Uh, and uh, we're not giving any free advice to the Kremlin here, right? Uh, so we're not <laughs> issuing uh, recommendations on how to control society better. I think it should be controlled less. Uh, so I wouldn't be, uh, again, uh, <laughs> advising on the subject willingly. Uh, Speaking of uh, the uh, surveillance techniques uh, and using digital instruments to uh, control uh, the people, like almost everything else in Russia, it didn't quite work out, nor did it quite fail. Uh, restrictions were uh, quite restricting. The uh, most important of them was the closing down of all uh, businesses, of all public spaces. Uh, so even if you were not prevented uh, by your smartphone from going out, there was just nowhere to go. Uh, digital passes were introduced in Moscow as well as in uh, quite a few other regions of Russia. I would name Tatarstan. That was the first to introduce them. And by the way, there it worked, uh, at least so far as I have heard, as I have learned, quite successfully. They were also the first to cancel this regime uh, of uh, electronic passes. They did it before, now, for example, Moscow Oblast did. And in Moscow, they're still in place. I was going out today, so my taxi driver both on my way and back asked me for a pass so I showed him my smartphone with a QR code yeah, so we have this digital uh, utopia in place and it's evident <laughs> that uh, at least the Moscow authorities are looking up uh, to Chinese models uh, for uh, as their ideal of what is called the smart city but on the, at the same time uh, after the very first day of introduction of these electronic passes and these restrictions, it was evident that there was an order to real physical offline policemen to not to uh, tamper with the people too much. There were a few cases of, for example, uh, somebody uh, trying to catch a mother with a stroller who went out for a walk, but then it very quickly stopped. So there was an understanding on the part of the authorities that they better not provoke popular anger. So uh, there was this, again, very Russian situation of, you know what we want you to do. And on the part of the people, yes, we know what we have to pretend we are doing. For quite some weeks, uh, people were keeping this very hard and very, again, very restrictive uh, restrictions. They were complying with the rules because they were scared of the virus. They didn't want to get infected. So the streets of Russian cities actually became empty. And as I often say, uh, one of the unsung virtues of Russian people is their law-abiding nature. They like to keep the rules, actually. Not only do they dislike mass violence extremely, not only do they have low toleration for state violence, in fact, uh, we can see it from every polling data that we have. And this, again, is completely misunderstood, I think, externally. But they also like to keep the rules and prefer doing this if the rules are not so absurd or contradictory that they cannot be kept. Sasha, did, did you touch this question as well about how the uh, yes, it was, the, uh, the, in the Chinese system is going to it, play? It's, inter it's, a, it's an interesting question because everybody, well, just before the pandemic uh, spread into Russia, not by the way from China, Russia has a long border with China, but the pandemic uh, came from the West that shows where exactly the most of human contacts between Russians and uh, foreigners belong. They are not with Asia, despite this turn to the East uh, so much, uh, so uh, loudly proclaimed, but with the, with the West, the uh, borders with China and other Asian countries were, um, were closed very, uh, very quickly. And they were very, uh, very unwilling, unwillingly and slow to unwilling and slow to close the borders with uh, such countries like well beloved uh, by everybody Italy or Spain uh, and the same with copying the measures 
Putin has made additional steps toward, towards uh, an ashamed, unashamed authoritarianism by well resetting the constitutional clock and proclaiming this amendment that allows him to go for <clears throat> to additional terms. But the quarantine measures and the digital sur sur surveillance were not copying the Ch Chinese uh, pattern, but to me were more similar uh, to the what we to what we saw in uh, Italy and Spain, but were much smoother. It was Spain in words, uh, but maybe Germany or not Sweden, but Germany or with with mixed mixed with Belarus uh, uh, in in reality. As uh, Yekaterina uh, mentioned, we had a leak of uh, uh, internal uh, secret instruction for the police not to bother people. And in fact, uh, here uh, in 15 kilometers from Moscow in a Dacia district, old Dacia district, by the way, it may be interesting, I'm living in a, in a township of old Dachas of Stalin time uh, that, were, that were given to the uh, people, artists of Mali theater, so state Mali theater, but my, uh, the Dacia I rented for the quarantine time belonged to a general of army, uh, of political, um, pol political, how to, how to say it? Commissar. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> of, of the Red Army who returned from the, uh, well, from the German, it was built in 1947. And the idea was to put some uh, military men, some generals, uh, and to mix them uh, with the artists. Well, uh, the, the same mixed was the, the Russian quarantine. They didn't follow, uh, they hasn't follow, they haven't followed, I'm sorry, the Chinese example. They were declaring their follow maybe the Spanish example, but in fact, it was much, much smoother. And uh, the anger we saw recently about the fact that uh, most, uh, mayor of Moscow, Sergei Sabanin, allowed uh, people to go to work by shifts. So the houses with such and such numbers go, uh, well, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and other numbers go the other days. Uh, the anger was not because of the restriction, but because this restriction was imposed on the reality that was much freer than this restriction. People already walked on the streets freely. And if they were not gathering in parks uh, for picnics, they were not bothered by the police or asked the, uh, uh, their QR uh, codes. Or look how delicate is uh, the system of surveillance. Uh, my friend caught not the virus, but the normal maybe flu and got on his telephone. He went to the uh, clinic and everybody was treated by default as a potential uh, bearer of the virus. And he, he was, the, the, this uh, application was imposed to his phone. Otherwise he would have been fined 4,000 rubles around about $70. And then he uh, had to make photo of himself uh, every like two or three hours showing that he stays at home. But the system started to work uh, only after he took the phone in his hands because before he may be sleeping and he was really sleeping his late, uh, like he awake, he, his late awake, no? awakening person so he was uh, awaiting around 1 and then 1 p.m. and then took the phone and then the system started working. So it was a very delicate uh, application for the uh, uh, digital terror. So did he, did he get fined? Everyone who has this app on their phone says they get fined for no reason. No, not yet. Okay. So I, okay. I suppose it was upgraded okay. version. In English, Good luck to him. In English, we call this a silver lining. So. Um, 
Let Since me... we, we share this house, so I know it is uh, <laughs> from the first hand. <laughs> uh, well, I'm conscious of our time, so we have a, we really have only a, a couple minutes left. I have one question I wanted to ask you, Katerina, on behalf of one of our colleagues, which I'll read to you. Um, you offered us your analysis about public attitudes about the state's response to COVID. Could you speculate about elite reactions to Putin's response, especially economic elites? How do they feel about Putin these days? And you can define economic elites in any way you want. Oh, these are complicated matters with not a lot of uh, open data to make judgments. But I can only say one thing. Russia has huge and yet untouched reserves. Russian economy is largely uh, statified. So the Russian oligarchs are state oligarchs, either completely or partly. Uh, so at this point, as, for, as, as of now, uh, the state has uh, huge opportunities of rewarding uh, its chosen ones for any losses they may have sustained or imagine they have sustained because of the crisis. So again, as of now, uh, loyalty pays off better than desertion of any kind. This, I think, is the basic line that we need to keep in mind before we go searching for some split in the elites or for some visible signs of uh, weakened presidential authority. Sasha, how, how do you think the elites are reacting? Specifically, there's obviously been a lot of uh, elite pressure on Mayor Sibyan, and, and I, I don't know if you want to Yes, I, I, sa I said a few words about that too, but you specifically asked about uh, economic elites, such as heads of state corporations, state banks, the, the so-called state oligarchs. Well, the so what, what, what do you think about the fate of uh, the Moscow mayoralty, Alexander? I'm also curious to hear your opinion. Uh, I don't, well, I, I cannot predict it. it well, the pandemic uh, is underway still. Uh, he was attacked from many uh directions but the most curious thing that the most the mo most recently he was attacked by a, a russian comedian that made made a parody of uh of both putin and sabanin basically the parody was about their talk to, to each other so their mm, they are laughed together at and at can make them closer against their common enemies. <laughs> uh, it was a very popular viral uh, video that uh, was uh, seen by millions and millions of Russia very well, Russians very quickly, similar to what happened uh, with several uh, Navalny videos. And it's maybe the first time uh, for many uh, for many years uh, when. Putin was the, the main personage, the main hero of such a comic video. It's a new phenomenon, or it's an old phenomenon, but forgotten. Okay. Uh, well, so I think, unfortunately, we're, I think we, we try to end on a high note. And I think that, you know, the adoption of humor for political purposes in Russia, we'll, we'll consider that a high point. Um, so in any event, um, I'm conscious of our time. I just wanted to, to okay. bring things to an yeah. end. Uh, Katrina Schulman, a professor at the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences. Um, I encourage everyone to start subscribing to her YouTube channel, which as I mentioned at the beginning has over a quarter million subscribers. Um, it's must watching. And Alexander Baunov, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Moscow Center, uh, editor of Carnegie.ru, which is an essential resource for Russian watchers, as well as the host of a regular podcast on Russian politics. So again, thank you so much to both of you and to everyone who's been joining us today. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you, Alexander, for uh, writing this fine article, which formed uh, not a pretext, but a topic of our discussion. Uh, and thank you for your questions and for your attention. Many thanks from my side to, to everybody. Mm-hmm.